With African countries facing an increased threat from COVID-19, the extraordinary China-Africa Summit on Solidarity Against COVID-19 has been held to promote mutual support, substantial public health cooperation, medical assistance, construction of the African CDC headquarters, vaccine availability, and other topics were discussed. So, what are the current situations in Africa, and what is involved in the China-Africa joint fight against COVID-19, and how are global communities such as the WHO responding? To talk about these issues and more, I'm joined by He Wenping. She's the senior research fellow at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and Dr. Sam Rasha, medical director of Medihio Hospital SD in Nairobi, Kenya. In the second part, we'll talk to Dr. Michelle Yao, Program Manager of Emergency Response for the WHO Regional Office for Africa. That is our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Zhou So at the extraordinary China-Africa Summit on Solidarity Against COVID-19, Chinese President Xi Jinping and leaders from South Africa, the African Union, Senegal, UN, and the WHO delivered their views and also announced their policies on the joint fight against COVID-19. So Ms. He, uh, from your perspective, what is the most urgent issue for Africa in tackling this pandemic? Well, of course, it's fighting uh, the COVID-19. Uh, that's the priority uh, mission right now. We all know uh, Africa now are also suffering from this uh, virus. Uh, even though those number, uh, I mean, the affected uh, uh, those patients and also the death toll now, comparing with other continents, is not that high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, before people thinking uh, the Africa maybe is potential. Uh, this very uh, the center of those uh, pandemic compared uh, together with like India, Brazil. But now we see the India and Brazil all rising uh, very rapidly, mm. uh, those uh, uh, effective But why cases. do you think it's still very low? Is it because undercounted or it is still developing? Oh, I think both uh, reasons are many. Uh, some are saying because uh, maybe the lumber, just the tip of the iceberg, uh, is not the real figure, uh, fit with the reality. Yeah, because some countries, they have reported those numbers. Maybe this is uh, like two weeks ago, those, those figures not uh, daily, uh, you know, reporting those uh, figures. And some of the countries are short of those uh, test equipment. So test, uh, those testing kits are, are simply not available. Uh, so uh, this is the reason. But another, I think, uh, strong reason is that is the African Union, both African Union, continental, this organization, and also different African countries, they have taken uh, very strong measures. Uh, actually, even from very beginning, uh, even since the January, at uh, the middle of January, yeah, when they heard some things happening in some uh, uh, part of the world, mm. and then they immediately, be, uh, like the CDC, we just talked about the Center of Disease Control, Africa, so they immediately began those uh, like uh, training for the expertise, like South Africa, this is uh, the biggest uh, economy in Africa. Uh, at the very beginning, they only have, uh, like, uh, I think it's maybe uh, 50, yeah, just uh, five zero, mm. uh, those discovered, those cases. So just a very small number. But even though very small number, and uh, you know, President Ramaphosa immediately issued this lockdown. lockdown yeah, the lockdown. Country. Yeah, the country. Yeah, for three weeks. So rather to uh, you know set up this barrier in the early stage. Yeah, it's better than when you just rush up trying to prevent the flooding coming over. Mm. I think this is also uh, the reason. And it, did you do you think the CDC in Africa mm -hmm. has played a central role in coordinating? the response from different countries. We understand that different countries have different healthcare systems in Africa. Yes, I think they have been doing a very good job. Uh, you know, the CDC, they have uh, uh, issued uh, very earlier stage, they issued a strategy and also pour over uh, those some fund. You know, some countries are very poor, they have mm -hmm. no money uh, to deal with this uh, disaster. So they pour over the, some fund, it's called the Fighting COVID-19 Fund, mm. so can help uh, some uh, extremely poor country, least developed country, yeah, to get some help yeah, from those funding. So CDC also like training expertise, as mm. I just mentioned. So the training expertise and to help those country, they're simply short of any uh, uh, people, know-how people. So uh, I think uh, through those like expertise training and the pool the funding together and also to coordinating all those situations in different countries. So I think uh, the job has been doing in a very good way. All right. Uh, let's talk to Dr. Shah. Oh, Dr. Shah, are the 
Kenyan President uh, Uhuru Kenyatta also attended the summit uh, today. What is it like in Kenya right now? Is it being well handled uh, in terms of the COVID-19 response? Yeah, you see, if we talk about Kenya, uh, now we are on the ascending part of the curve. We are going to, we are towards the peak of the curve right now. Every day the cases are increasing in Kenya. Uh, definitely government has put uh, measures which are definitely going to help like social distancing and uh, mass gathering were blocked very early before uh, we saw this curve of pandemic. But uh, still there is a lot more to be done in Kenya because uh, we still lack a lot of uh, healthcare facilities. We still lack uh, a lot of uh, information being carried to the people and we still lack a lot of testing facility. So I think there is a lot more to be done, but definitely I can say the country is doing good uh, compared to that of other parts of the world. And yes, the summit today is about China-Africa cooperation to jointly fight COVID-19. What kind of help uh, has Kenya received from China and uh, are they uh, in any way contributed to your efforts to contain the disease? Yeah, you see, it was definitely a good uh, initiative being taken by China, I would say, because uh, what was uh, recommended by WHO was we should attain a testing of uh, 1,000 cases per million population by May 4th. This was the recommendation given by China, WHO. But you see, we could not attain that because of lack of uh, testing facilities. But since the Chinese assistance comes, since Jack Ma's assistance has come, we are able to reach that target now. At least in Kenya, we are able to do at least 3,000 tests per million population today. Mm -hmm. uh, I would definitely uh, mm -hmm. say that there was a bigger contribution from China uh, in regard to testing facility. There was even a lot of webinars being conducted and uh, uh, health healthcare exchange was being done, wherein a lot of expertise from China have been assisting uh, the medical practitioners in Kenya to understand the disease pattern because China was the first country to see this disease. So I think they have a lot of skills and experience about this compared to us. So I think it came as a bigger help to us. Definitely, I would say that we were able to do better compared to that what we did before. And Ms. He, of course, uh, China and Africa has been making a lot of cooperations, but most people understand is the economic cooperation, trade interactions. Why is China playing such an active role in helping Africa responding to COVID-19? Oh, well, uh, we all regarded ourselves uh, as the biggest developing country and African continent are hosting the most a number of those uh, developing countries as well. So we have been sharing uh, the same like uh, this uh, history, like fighting for independence, fighting for like economic independence, both political independence. So those uh, share the history and share the value. So of course, bound China and Africa together. Uh, for example, uh, especially since 2013, when the B, uh, BRI Belt and Road Initiative has been issued, so a number of uh, those uh, projects has been doing now in Africa. Mm. So if Africa's economy has been getting, you know. Uh, worse and worse mm. uh, from, from this COVID-19. Of course, there's also a loss uh, for China's investment. Okay. So we are bound together economically and also like this uh, health uh, security also because there are many ch uh, Chinese now in Africa, they cannot like take a flight or coming home. Mm. So they stay there. We hope they stay safe. So I can daily I can get a lot of information from those Chinese now studying or working in Africa. Mm. Yeah, there are many, one million Chinese people there. Yeah, you, you earlier mentioned that uh, South Africa, for example, practiced lockdown very early mm. into the COVID-19. But that is also a problem because many African countries rely on people uh, traveling to and from for its economy. There is a balance made between economic uh, uh, recovery and uh, containment of the COVID-19. How do you think African countries should do? Yeah, this is a very uh, hard, you know, the balancing, uh, striking this balance yeah. Yeah, between control the disease and then struggling for the economic recovery. Yeah. So that's why some country, yeah, I heard some country like Ghana, like Senegal, now they think they cannot hold on anymore. Yeah. So they want to reopen the economy uh, because a lot of people like they living in the slums. Yeah, they. Uh, counted on the daily income to survive. Mm. They don't have any. They're more vulnerable, for example, yeah, than China. Yeah, that's called the informal economy. Oh. Yeah, daily on the street, sell something, and then get some income, and then can buy those food for daily. So they don't have any deposit in the bank. 
So this kind of issue, I think uh, now uh, is a test for those African uh, leaders, yeah, how to keep the balance. Now I think they have been handling quite well. For example, uh, they learned some experience from China, like make several levels of those risky. Mm. Yeah, we, in China we also huh, high Differentiated risky. Differentiated policy. Yeah, it's not like one feet. size fit all. Uh, like whole the country, if some area is zero, uh, those cases, you don't need to stay at home and then say not go to the office. So different level, different risky level, and then different way of doing business. So if a very heavy, serious area, high risky, of course, stay at home. Like in Egypt, in Cairo, it's a very dangerous area mm. because most of the cases in capital city. So even I heard my friends there, they are saying they have been encouraged to stay at home for home office. Mm. No need to come to, uh, to the office. So uh, for others, like uh, some Belt and Road uh, project, they are just building uh, those uh, high buildings. Uh, there's a construction site. It's open air. So it's not that dangerous, not clouded like in your shopping, in the shop, uh, supermarket. Mm. So it's open air, and then so they can uh, arrange like those shifted walking. Yeah, no need to come all these 100 workers come over. Yeah, maybe 20 a day. And all those 20, uh, when they came over, and then they will give them test of uh, temperature. So it's not saying, oh, come over to work and then ignore all those uh, security, health security. Right. So combine them together. Uh, Dr. Shah, if that targeted precise policies towards different uh, demographies must rely on accurate data, do you think African countries uh, have improved their capability gathering data and uh, making targeted policies? Uh, for COVID-19? Yes. Yeah, you see, uh, we are not uh, see the data. What we are seeing right now for COVID-19, I think that's not uh, a real number because we still lack uh, a lot of testing facility. A lot of cases go undetected because of lack of testing facility. So I think the numbers what we are seeing right now is not uh, the actual number. I would say the number is way beyond what we are seeing. I can say it is just a tip of iceberg. Uh, what we are seeing. And uh, unless uh, these international collaborations are being done, unless there is assistance from IMF and China and World Bank, I don't think so African continent would be able to keep up with this pandemic. Mm. Uh, African continent mm. alone cannot reach the target which is to be achieved. And what do you think uh, the next step uh, will be the most important thing for example Kenya and also other African countries especially in, in the south? Yeah, you see, what is more important right now is that we need to have uh, more and more technology. There are three issues, I would say. Uh, the first one would be we need to have more and more of information technology because, you see, there is still on the ground level people have a myth that Africans will not get COVID-19. Say, black, popular, black tea helps in uh, immunity and you don't get COVID-19. Such kind of thoughts are still there across the country and across the African continent. I think the so, lack of information technology is the biggest challenge what we have. Uh, the information should reach even the periphery of the country. That is the first thing what I feel. Then secondly, I feel there is lack of collaboration between the government bodies and the healthcare facilities, mm. or I would say public-private mm -hmm. partnership, uh, which is going to definitely help us if we have a public-private partnership to cope up with this pandemic. And third thing is, I think there is a lot of uh, healthcare uh, facility in the form of uh, we don't have many um, uh, isolation centers for COVID-19, we don't have many ventilators for that matter, we don't have many testing facilities for that matter. So I think if the assistance is provided in the form of ventilators, masks, then uh, isolation facilities, the hospitals to take care of COVID-19, I think it's going to change the curve, definitely for sure. All right. Thank you, Dr. Shah, and thank you, Ms. Ho. And in the next part of our program, we will talk to Michelle Yao, Program Manager of Emergency Response for the WHO Regional Office. And now on Africa response to COVID-19 and the China's cooperation with Africa and together with WHO, we're joined by Dr. Michelle Yao, Program Manager, Emergency Response, WHO Regional Office for Africa. So, Dr. Yao, uh, what is WHO's take on the trend in Africa in terms of COVID-19? For WHO is uh, to ensure that uh, at least uh, we have a strong surveillance system that can help us to detect cases, 
to confirm them and then isolate a uh, case uh, um, um, and also provide uh, appropriate uh, treatment uh, while uh, also ensuring that communities are well uh, informed uh, about preventive measures and these preventive measures are in place. And while uh, also responding to COVID, ensuring that also uh, the communities can continue to have access to basic services like vaccination, like also uh, maternal and uh, child uh, services, health services that uh, require also to continue in the particular context of uh, Africa. So for us, uh, is uh, countries to have capacity to perform these different activities that is uh, our main uh, concern. We understand that Africa is the last continent to be hit by the pandemic. And how will the battle of Africa affect the global picture? In this, this is a pandemic, and uh, uh, the world won't be safe. Is uh, one of the uh, area remain uh, affected. Uh, so um, uh, the African uh, countries uh, uh, experienced cases. Uh, um, I think uh, toward the end of uh, February and, and, and March, uh, most of the cases were imported. And now we have uh, a community spread in more than half of the countries, and uh, uh, is, the numbers are even increasing in some countries. So our fear is uh, um, these numbers to increase further, and uh, with also the existing capacity not being able to control. And if this happens, then the world won't be safe because. Mm. Uh, uh, even if the cases are controlled uh, elsewhere, these uh, areas can be reinfected again if we still have uh, an hotspot in Africa. And China has expressed will to uh, lend a helping hand. I know the WHO is also uh, taking part in the extraordinary China-Africa summit on solidarity against COVID. How are these joint efforts between China, Africa, the WHO and then the UN uh, panning out? I think uh, this uh, effort uh, have, uh, should have uh, the short term. The short term uh, is uh, to control the outbreak. And to control the outbreak, uh, the major uh, contribution that uh, will uh, require a solidarity is to make available uh, the different supplies that, uh, uh, the different supplies that uh, is required for Africa to respond to the, the crisis. It includes protective equipment. It includes also laboratory equipment as well as uh, mm. uh, laboratory uh, supply that is uh, required for, um, for, for the response. So uh, these are critical um, um, uh, support that is needed um, for the detection as well as also for the treatment. Uh, the treatment capacity include equipment like uh, oxygen uh, suppliers or, or, or also uh, uh, ventilators that is, uh, is, is required uh, for countries to increase this capacity. And the last component is uh, while doing so to be able to cover the vulnerable people that need uh, basic uh, interventions, including uh, even access to food as well as uh, also other services that have to manage uh, the health conditions that are uh, recurrent in Africa, like malaria, like TB, like uh, HIV-8 and uh, other uh, uh, health conditions that uh, need uh, also interventions while uh, trying to manage COVID. So this should be at the shorter term and then the longer term uh, dealing on how to strengthen the overall health system, how to strengthen uh, um, uh, emergency response uh, capacity. So this should be uh, then the next step. So this collaboration, I think, should target both how to uh, uh, control the outbreak and how to strengthen at the medium and longer term the health system. Well, you mentioned capacity building. The pandemic obviously has exposed the deficit of spending on public health systems in Africa. So what recommendations do you have for improving the continent's public health systems? And how can China, WHO, and other partners help? Um, WHO um, is pushing forward uh, a program called uh, Universal Health uh, Coverage, uh, aiming at uh, ensuring access to uh, health services uh, uh, with uh, removing all the different barriers. Um, one of them is the financial barrier where people uh, have to uh, uh, deplete all the uh, the, the wealth to, to deal with health issues. So 
uh, this is a comprehensive program, and this program uh, um, target the different elements of, of the health system. Uh, it includes the uh, strengthening uh, the managerial part, the, what we call the governance part, how to, de to decentralize uh, this structure from the big capital cities up to the smaller cities. Uh, so the health management, uh, health service management component uh, is, uh, is, is critical. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's also how to support infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure is uh, also to ensure that uh, regardless where you are in Africa, you can have access to quality uh, health services, at least the basic uh, services that uh, address uh, uh, the uh, health issues that are very recurrent, uh, mainly uh, dealing with high child mortality, high uh, mother's mortality. So maternal uh, health uh, services uh, is also uh, one of the critical. There is also component related to supply. Uh, we notice in this crisis that uh, access to medicines is a challenge. Uh, we have less manufacturing uh, uh, capacity in Africa and we mm. rely most of the time on importation of medicines. And this cannot help to cover the gap, mainly when we have a situation like a pandemic where uh, each of the countries need to produce uh, for their own uh, citizen is make it uh, difficult. So the supply uh, as well as the different equipment is also critical and also some of the innovation uh, connectivity if we we have to build more capacity COVID teachers that uh, for example to do training virtual training uh, uh, a, a good thing to move forward but uh, in many African countries this is not possible in many uh, of the cities um, uh, as well as also using it even to track uh, contact and to follow up contact uh, in places where you have been. So these uh, technologies uh, um, into the health system is also one of the points. And then the last point is how can we train more people? Uh, we were talking, for example, on the use of ventilators in COVID, but we have less anesthesiologists. So how uh, to combine effort to train more people based on the specific need of Africa is essential. So this uh, uh, global uh, solidarity in support to uh, all the different elements that I mentioned, uh, the governance, the health services, the equipment, the health uh, 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 the human uh, resource uh, training, uh, as well as even the funding mechanism, how poor people can have access to the services. Uh, 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 so there is a need to put in place a funding mechanism that can allow uh, access to uh, this uh, uh, fragile population that we are experiencing. And then the last part is how can we then build a stronger rapid response mechanism to respond to the different crises, public health crisis, but also natural disaster and humanitarian crisis that we are having mm. in uh, Africa. As you said, uh, probably COVID-19 is not only a public health challenge, it's also an economic and social challenge. I know African countries have made some progress in terms of prevention and control, but also it affected the economic, social and public health systems. What can WHO help? Uh, WHO uh, can uh, uh, mainly advocate around uh, what we call the health determinant. Uh, what are issues that uh, impact on the health of the population? Uh, of course, a few of them that uh, we can uh, uh, refer to. One of them is the food. Uh, so food security, having access to food, um, like uh, increased uh, capacity of production, but also availability uh, on the market with uh, transport and so on. So uh, it's uh, about agriculture, but have also a, 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 an economical and also development uh, um, issues. Um, there is uh, also uh, ensuring that uh, people uh, have access to the basic to avoid uh, some of the disease, uh, access to water, uh, even access to basic activities that can increase the uh, income. And this income, if it's well invested, can also uh, have an impact in terms of uh, mort mm. child mortality, uh, in terms of mother's mortality, because at least they can have the minimum to access to the health uh, uh, facilities. Obviously, COVID-19 is still raging uh, in Africa, but the sudden 
region is the most affected and overtaking the northern region based on what we know so far when do you think it will peak and uh, how long does it take for us to keep this in control uh, the, uh, it's difficult to say in uh, the South Africa is uh, actually uh, one of the, uh, the epicenter uh, right now, with uh, uh, an average uh, uh, between 2,000 and 3,000 cases per, per day. Um, they are doing the right thing. They need to scale up. Uh, they need also um, to uh, address the different drivers, the risk factors, uh, including transmission within the community and uh, um, ensure uh, also scale up. Uh, preventive uh, uh, measures, uh, but it's difficult to see the the peak uh, is still uh, increasing. Uh, so um, uh, for time being, uh, I think uh, it will increase um, uh, again more in the coming uh, week, and, and uh, um, maybe um, I, I, I may not say uh, give a time, but uh, um, uh, if we look at the different cycle. Uh, it takes at least uh, two weeks for people that have been contaminated now to see, um, uh, to see the impact. So uh, what uh, uh, preventive measures that are in place now will be seen in two weeks. So uh, mm. probably in two weeks' time, we can see if the trend is uh, decreasing or if it's still increasing, but difficult to set a right time. Uh, I think we should... Uh, we are encouraging the uh, health authorities there to continue what they are doing well. They have increased uh, uh, the testing. Uh, more than 20,000 testing per day is a, is a, a big step. Uh, they need to continue, and they need also to strengthen preventive measures and also have a tight uh, surveillance system that can help them to make an appropriate public health decision uh, that will help to stop this increase. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Yao, and good luck. Thank you. And that will wrap up this edition of Dialogue here on CGTN. I'm Zoe in Beijing. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.